Happy Sabbath, Church, and welcome to the first Sabbath of December. It is the last month of the year, and we are so excited that it is the Christmas season. We can just bask in the knowledge that this is the time where we celebrate the Savior and His arrival. We have a couple of announcements for you today. The first is just a reminder of our food bank at Anaheim. Every Wednesday at 5 o'clock, there is food distribution of boxes and boxes of food. We just heard from Pastor Mark that last week we actually had a lot of boxes left over. So if you are needing some food, do not hesitate to come on over and get some food. We have two things that we'd like to share with you. The first is a reminder of our toy drive that we are having collected here at Orange Church. Please make sure you bring the toys or gift cards or whatever you would like to bring by December 14th so we would be able to package it and distribute it accordingly. Also a reminder, at Anaheim, December 12th, there is a baptism that is occurring, so we could rejoice in that, and if you are the family, I'm sure you're aware of it, you can please show up. But December 19th, we will be showing it on our video, so you would be able to see the baptism uh, there December 19th. We also want to share with you some exciting news and activity that we plan to have here at Orange Church is on Friday, December 18th at 7 p.m. here in the parking lot. We're going to have some Christmas caroling. If you would like to come and sing or you want to contribute with an instrument or you would just like to come and be in the festive uh, participation of it all, we invite you to come. Put that on your calendar and please come and join us. It will be a great time right here at Orange Church in the parking lot, Friday, December 18th at 7 p.m. You have a blessed day and happy Sabbath. Our opening hymn for this morning is a beloved one, number 115 in our hymnals, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We, not unlike Israel, are eagerly awaiting our Messiah. So sing this with the yearning in your heart. Come quickly. O come, O come, Emmanuel. And ransom captive Israel That mourns in lonely exile here Until the Son of God appear Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel Shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, thou wisdom from on high, and order all things far and nigh. To us the path of knowledge show. And cause us in her ways to go. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, desire of nations, bind. All peoples in one heart and mind Bid envy, strife, and quarrel cease Fill the whole world with heaven's peace Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel Shall come to thee, O Israel. Good morning once again. It is time for children's story. So if there are any kids in the house that are maybe in other rooms, call them on over. Johnny, Sally, Timmy. It is time for children's story. Boys and girls, I have a surprise for you today, and it's a delicious surprise. When I show it to you, your, your salivary glands might start going, and that's okay if they do. Something that is a Christmas treat that I enjoyed as a kid is a 
candy cane. Yummy, yummy, yummy. When I was a kid, I used to lick these candy canes and suck on them, and I never thought about a significance to them other than that they were sweet and yummy. But did you know that the candy cane actually has many beautiful spiritual teachings for us? First of all, let's look at the shape of the candy cane. What is the shape? And you could say, well, it's a cane, Pastor Mark. It's kind of like what people use to walk around sometimes. And that's true, I suppose. But if you look at it, it also looks like a shepherd's staff. Do you, have you ever seen a picture of a shepherd? And they kind of use it as a walking stick and it has this hook on the end of it. How do we have an illustration in the Bible about a shepherd? Do you remember a very important place in the Bible, Psalm 23, that says, The Lord is my shepherd, and I have everything I need. I don't lack anything. And it says, Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Shepherds used to actually have two things with them most of the time, a rod and a staff. I guess we could break one of these and make it like a rod. And the shepherds would have two of these, and with the rod, they could gently guide the sheep. They could press it on one side of them, or if maybe the sheep was biting or fighting, they could even tap it on the head to let it know that it needed to get smarter or something like that. And then the staff would be if the, if the sheep fell down in a gully or a ditch, they could actually reach down with the hook part and put it around the sheep's middle and pick it back up and bring it back up. And so the Bible talks about a shepherd's rod and a staff that help guide and comfort. Is there another place in the Bible that talks about a shepherd? I know, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and all my sheep follow me, and they know my voice, and I will lead them to green pastures, they will be my flock, and I will be their shepherd. Isn't that so beautiful? That's from John chapter 10. But beyond the shape of it, we've also got some colors. What are the colors of a candy cane? Red and white, that's right. And it's not just the colors of peppermint. These colors have very significant meaning. First of all, white. Do you know what white represents? If you've ever been to a wedding, you might have seen that the bride dresses up in white. Why does she do that? And is that why it's on the candy cane too? White, many places in the Bible and also out in society, represents purity. That it's not spotted or stained or, uh, uh, or dirty or anything. And so white can represent purity. And of course, Jesus is absolutely pure. God is absolutely pure and beautiful. But we don't also have white. We have red. What would red represent, boys and girls? That's right. I think some of you got it. It represents the blood of Jesus. Friends, you and I could not be clean if it was not for the blood of Jesus that pours over us uh, metaphorically and forgives us of all of our sin. And so this candy cane represents both the purity of Jesus and the forgiveness Jesus brings with his blood. I want you to think of that next time you eat a candy cane. And there's one last thing about a candy cane, just in case we are prone to forget. I know that lots of boys and girls out there are learning their letters and learning to read. What letter does the candy cane make if you turn it over? It makes a J. J for Jesus. Jesus, the good shepherd. Jesus, the one who gave his blood and brings his purity to us in forgiveness. So boys and girls, I hope you get to enjoy a few candy canes here over the Christmas holiday. But when you do so, don't just think of how yummy it is. Think of how beautiful it is that it represents Jesus, his love, his guiding presence, and his forgiveness. God bless you all. Another Sabbath has come, and it seems like we have a whole new whirlwind of concerns. We may be overwhelmed by it, but praise the Lord, we can entrust it to the hands of he who, by definition, cannot be overwhelmed. The Bible says to cast every burden, every anxiety, every care on Jesus. He cares for us so much, and he will see to it. As we prepare our hearts, let's sing the beloved song, I cast all my cares upon you. I cast all my cares upon you. I lay all of my burdens down at your feet. And any time I don't know what to do, I will cast all my cares upon you. Let us pray. Kind Father in heaven, we thank you that we could be here on this day, your day. We thank you for this Thanksgiving season. 
where we can stop and pause and reflect on all the wonderful things that you have done for us. We realize that things are not exactly normal, but you are always in charge and you are in control. And even though we face difficulties, we know we can always trust in you and that you will be there and you will provide for all of our needs. We ask, though our congregation is apart and we are using other means to be together and to praise you, that we will be together in our hearts and that we will all together thank and praise you for all that you do. May your Holy Spirit be with each one who is here taking part and listening to this program. May your Holy Spirit continue to guide us and be with us in all that we do. We ask that we will be lights of the world and that as we leave this congregation and go out into the world that we will be able to be your ambassadors and continue to lift you up and lift up your name. We pray for those who we know who are sick, those who are discouraged, those who are facing financial difficulties. We place them in your hand and in your care. We ask that your coming will be soon and that as we live these last days on earth that we'll prepare ourselves and prepare others for your soon coming. This we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Good morning once again. Our scripture reading for today comes from Genesis 3, verse 15, and I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. It reads like this, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. May God add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the doing of his word. You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout, I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. He's making a list, he's checking it twice. He's gonna find out who's naughty and who's nice. Santa Claus is coming to town. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. We've all heard this song. In fact, we've probably sung it as we were kids and even sing it to our kids. But many times we glance over on what this song means. Santa sees our behavior and he cares about our morality. Notice the song even writes that Santa even writes down the bad names, not just the good names. He wants to know who deserves a gift and who does not. You see, being good means you're going to be on the nice list. It means you're going to get a present. You're going to get a gift that Santa's been planning for, as the story goes, all year long with all the, all the little elves creating these things all year long, putting energy and effort to make this such a special day. And you get a gift at the end of the year if you're good. Or you'll be on the naughty list. You're one who does not get a gift. As if to say a Santa is flying over each house. He sees a naughty house, he sticks his nose in the air and flies over and leaves. Regardless of what this year has brought or not brought, it doesn't change the newness that builds the excitement in this time of the year. It is during this season that we celebrate the arrival of the one who brings all newness, who makes all things new, who brings creation into a new recreation, who promises to remove sin and all that is broken and all that is wrong and to make things right and to bring harmony and peace forever. You see, it's interesting how the message to kids is to be good, to focus on the behavior and you will get a gift. But it is in this act that we see that Santa fails because what God goes after is not just behavior, he goes after the hearts. In fact, it's not just a gift of the stuff we have, but it is the greatest gift, the gift of himself, the gift of life and life abundantly that we could even experience today. The gift, the gift of his son, 
Do you know that God also makes a list? It says in the book of life that he writes down names. But many of us think it's what he writes down as good or bad. But the one thing that God looks for is the blood of Jesus. Are you covered by the blood of Jesus? Are you following the Lamb wherever he goes, as the book of Revelation says? Because that is what God looks for. You see, the world that we live in, they focus on, are your good deeds outweighing your bad deeds? You look at religions across the world, did you do enough good to outweigh the bad? Or you must perform a certain way and then you will receive good things. Even in the world that we live in today, if you are good, if you are smart, if you are good looking, if you have what the world sees, you will get even more. But see, God doesn't work that way. Scripture reminds us no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you work, you cannot earn yourself the gift of salvation. But it is the gift. It is the gift that God gives because of Jesus. When God sees the list, he looks, is Jesus covered over your life? Is he the Lord of your life? Is he the one that you desire most of all? That's the list. Is Jesus in your life? Today we're going to start a series about a list that Jesus talks about, a list that God actually says throughout Scripture. And the good news is it has nothing to do with you but what God has already done. We look at these messianic lists of prophecies or future predictions of who the Savior is, what he's done, why he's doing it, and that no matter what you have done or not done, you can still be written in the book of life because of what he has done, because his blood covers your life, covers your sins. This is the season where we remember this is what the Savior has done, and we must Receive that if we are to be on that list, in that book of life, to have that chance at eternity. There are four major prophecies that a, 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 an author, Jacques Ducan, writes in his book on the Messianic prophecies. He talks about four specific prophecies and in this series we're going to be talking about just two of them. But before we begin, I'd like to open up with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear God, we are so grateful for the time of this season of the joy that this time brings because it is a time that we remember that you came, that you left heaven, that you left all that there is, the joy, the beauty, the glory to come to this place. As prophesied long ago, you promised to come to this place because of our brokenness to save us in our destruction. God, we ask that as we turn the pages of Scripture that you would remind us, that you would reinforce in our hearts and our minds that, God, it is you who does the work. And it is us who desperately need to receive it from you. Because, God, this time of the year and all of life really is about you. And so we ask that you would speak to us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first prophecy that we find is actually in the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3. As you turn there, I'd like to give you a little bit of background that God, as we said, has a list. But it wasn't a written list, it was a spoken list. How amazing is that, that God speaks and creation happens. The list begins, he created light, then he created the sky, and then he goes from there and he creates the land and the sea and the plants and the moon and the stars and the creatures of the sea and the sky and finally the animals and people. And then he finally <sighs> takes a breath and he rests. And we know that he made that list because it tells us he made that list. But we know he checked it twice because at the end of each one it says he stood back and he said, man, that was good. He made a list, he checked it twice, and he only made the nice. There was nothing naughty that God had made. He said it was good. 
Genesis chapter 2 verse 9 says this, And out of the ground the Lord made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and also with it the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God made everything perfect. He made everything good. He made everything wholesome. Something every parent would want for their child because even Jesus in his own words says this in Matthew, what parent would give his child a stone if they asked for bread or a snake if they asked for fish. God only gives good things. This was God's gift to us. He made the list. He planned it even beforehand and he gave it to us. But he gave us one command, just one and we have the choice, the reminder, for better, for worse, to choose. Because in the middle of the garden, God puts in the heart of this beautiful place, God puts in all that is perfect and great, God puts in the middle the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. In the middle. He didn't put it in a corner. He didn't hide it. He put it in the heart of the garden to remind us there is a choice. There is constantly a choice in life. No matter where you go in life, there is constantly a choice. And notice the emphasis. We may ask ourselves, God, what are you doing? Are you wanting us to fail? Are you trying to tempt us? What are you doing by doing this? It's reminded to tell us that wrong and right are that close to each other. The choice to choose God or not to choose God, they're that close to each other. Right and wrong are constantly side by side no matter where we go in the beauty of the earth or in the darkness that sometimes we may find ourselves. There is a choice right next to each other constantly. As the words of Joshua says, choose this day whom you will serve. In the midst of all life, wherever we find ourselves, there is a choice. And they're right next to each other. In the hearts of the garden. Whom will you serve? And this is why the enemy was so successful. It's because he knew what was right and he knew what was wrong and he knew that they were right next to each other, both trees. You always have a choice. And we get to choose. And the beauty in all that is, we have that freedom to choose, but each choice has their consequence. Genesis 2, 16 and 17 says this, And the Lord God commanded, commanded the man, You may freely eat of the tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. This is the setting in which Adam and Eve find themselves in. And in fact, this is the setting we find ourselves in each and every day. Choose this day. You have these choices in life, and whichever you choose, there are consequences to them. And God in His graciousness gave them the plan ahead of time. He told them, this will happen if you do this. Beware of two things that we find ourselves in in this story, that we also will find ourselves in our very lives. Notice the setting now that we find ourselves in. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, notice the elements and the characters and the players in this. It says, now, in Genesis 3, verse 1, now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. I want to focus just on two descriptions, just two. The first is this word, crafty. This word crafty. This word crafty actually is a Hebrew word that means erum, and it literally means prudence. It actually means wise. We look at this word and we think of something crazy or devious, and that's, that, that's the other part of it, but this word actually means prudent. It means wise, but it also tags it with another word. It's the understanding of truth, but to wield it for your own pleasure. In other words, in the shrewdness and the management of your own affairs. You have the wisdom to do something, and yet you do it and use it for evil. This is what crafty means. Because did you even know that Solomon was wise? The wisest man that ever lived. But even he made the grave mistake of using it for his own pleasure. Of using his wisdom for his own affairs. Something that God had given to him, used it for himself. 
How true is that in the person of Satan? How true of that who knows the Bible inside and out to use it for his own pleasures? How true is that of some people with the powers in the world that we live in who have the knowledge, who have the capacity to use things and yet use it for evil? How true is that even for you and for me who know the truth and sometimes choose not to use it or do it correctly? We have been entrusted with the Word of God. We have been entrusted with the gift of the Holy Spirit. How are we using it? Are we doing the same as the enemy and using the wisdom for our own ways? Are we ourselves being crafty? And the second is the word wild. Why does God put in the text wild. Aren't animals automatically wild? Why the reference to the word wild? Isn't that just assumed? I think it's to make a point. You see, an animal is not only free. When we say wild, they're free. They could do their own things, which is amazing and it's beautiful. But wild also means they act on their instincts. They act on what is innate to themselves. And in places where it is to act on its own ways, its own untamed ways, it could be destructive. Which is why God himself told Adam, name the animals, give them a name, build a relationship, light, lead them, guide them, have dominion over the land, over the earth, lead and guide them. As if to say, you and I, can easily fall to the crafty ways of the enemy. We could fall to the wildness that is in ourselves from the sin that we live in. We can fall unless we are following someone who can direct us, someone who can guide us, someone who, in a sense, could tame us and show us the right way of living. Because if not, it is very easy to go astray to our own ways. We see in Revelation chapter 12 that the serpent himself, the great deceiver, deceived a third of the angels, redirected them, was crafty, used the wisdom from God that he'd been given for his own ways, and pulled a third of perfect angels. See, like Adam and Eve, we are given wisdom from God, but we can use it to satisfy the wildness of our hearts and live in untamed, impulsive, and destructive ways as the crafty serpent. We need Jesus to guide us in the right ways, or we too can live a life of cunning, self-seeking, and crafty ways. It is important, church, that we know the truth. It is important, church, that we follow the truth. It is important that we are aware that the, the options to choose between right and wrong are constantly right in front of us, even in the Garden of Eden, even in complete perfection and beauty. The choice was constantly in center, right in front of them. Notice the part that Adam and Eve played and that you and I even play today and how it looks in our lives. Genesis chapter 3, verse 3 says this, as the serpent came, he said this to Eve, You shall not eat of... Genesis chapter 3, verse 3. And it says, The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the trees that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of it, of the fruit, and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he also ate. Church, knowing the truth is important. It is crucial. And notice Eve gives two inaccurate references. The first is the location versus the description. Notice her words. She says, the tree in the middle of the garden is forbidden and you can't touch it. Genesis 2, 9 tells us the tree of knowledge of good and evil was in the middle of the garden, but what else was in the middle of the garden? The tree of life. She was just pointing, oh, the tree in the middle. The tree in the middle. This is important, churches, we're going to go on. The other thing is she says you cannot touch it. And it says you shall not eat it. 
Why is this important? Because the devil is constantly bombarding us every single day. And if we cannot speak the truth to him, we're in trouble. Notice when Jesus himself was inside the wilderness and he was being tempted by the devil, Jesus only spoke truth. He spoke the words of scripture. He said, the, it is written, and he spoke. It is written, and he spoke. Every time the devil tried to come at him, he did not shy away. He did not point in generalities. He spoke specifically, this is the word of God, and I'm going to stand on it. Eve did not know the truth, and she was led astray. It is so important, church, to say we cannot eat of that tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Be direct, be specific in our own lives. When the devil is coming to us, we need to be specific. We need to be direct. We need to know what God has said, but also what God enables to us. Resist the devil and he will flee, as scripture tells us. Eve did not do this. Jesus says, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Eve fell because she did not know the truth. You will not die, for God knows that when you eat, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The choice to do wrong or right is constantly before us. And notice the devil used these three forms, as he did with Jesus, open rebellion. You will not die. This is not so. This is not true. Very direct, blatant lie. And the second, he twists the truth. Did he say you would surely die? Are you sure? You want to think about that? Does that make sense? No, that's not true. Think about it. And the last one, he tries to distract us. To distract us with something else. To distract us with something that we might like. To distract us with something that would be appealing to us. He says, you will be like God. This past week, there was a world-famous boxing match between Mike Tyson and another gentleman. And, this, and Mike Tyson hasn't been boxing over 15 years. And the one he battled was just retired for about three years. And they went into this boxing match and it was epic and everyone was watching. And the horrible news is that it came out to be a tie. And so it was news, but it wasn't as much news as the fight before. Because the fight before was a former NBA player. And he was bragging how he would destroy the opponent, who is a boxer. He's a basketball player. And he says, I'm going to shock the world. He was training. He was battling. He says, I'm bigger. I'm stronger. I'm faster. And he was knocked out in the second round. Completely cold, lying there, knocked out. Basketball players started joking and responding on Twitter and social media. One even said, I see no lies. Because he literally shocked the world by getting knocked out so quickly. Like Adam and Eve, we might say, I'm going to shock the world. Wow, the devil's giving this to me. I'm going to shock the world. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something great. I'm going to do something awesome by trying to do it our own ways. And here comes the devil trained with the knowledge. He knows the truth. He twists it. He knows it inside and out. And he's trained for this. And we get knocked out time after time. In his embarrassment, Nate Robinson took himself also off social media. He still hasn't responded. He's been humiliated, shamed, embarrassed. What's going to happen? We still don't know. We can say the same of Adam and Eve. They were shamed. They were embarrassed. They sowed fig leaves. They hid behind trees. And what begets one lie continues to a next. What begins as something that's a secret begets another secret. We don't, if we don't have Christ in our lives, we're constantly going further and further in that direction. And we hide behind the comforts of life. We try to hide behind our accomplishments or, or maybe our significance or, or simply we just try to control things. 
These are the fig leaves. These are the trees that we try to hide behind. But notice it says that God came after them and he came walking after them. Isaiah 1 tells us, Come now, let us argue it out, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Jesus came after them. He came after them. You know, church, I really believe that Adam and Eve's consequences would have been drastically different if they responded differently. Because Jesus even gave them a chance on top of the structure, on top of everything that he gave them, on top of, on top of telling them what the consequences would be, he still came after them and he asked them, what happened? And what did they do, church? They just blamed each other. The gift that God gave in each other, they blamed each other. The gift that God gave them in the world, they blamed that. They blamed the serpent. They couldn't take responsibility based on their own words, on their own misgivings. The consequences came. The curse came. It wasn't just the actions and God gave them a consequence. No, he talked to them. He gave them an opportunity. He gave them an option. And church, I tell you today, that's what God does with us. Even after messing up, even after checking the list twice, God still reaches down and comes to us and reasons with us because that's the God we serve. And the consequences came in the form of the curse. It says, Cursed is the snake who will now crawl on his belly. Cursed is the woman who will now have birth pains increased. And the man will no longer just walk through life in ease, but it will be painful. Death will surround the earth. Wherever you go, there will be death. It will be hard for you to work by the sweat of your brow. There will be death. It will be difficult. It will be hard. It will be painful. And you will do everything you can to make it work, but it will still be a struggle. That is the curse that will be in this world. God made a list. He checked it twice. But now we see Adam and Eve, as we could say, are in a naughty list. But does God take away the gift? Does God take away the promise? Does God write them off? No. God stepped in in Genesis 3.21. It says, And the Lord God made garments of skin for the man and for his wife, and he clothed them. The first death we see is of an animal sacrifice, and God took off their shame, and he put on his forgiveness. He put on his blood. He put on that forgiveness towards them and say, You can still live. You will still be on this earth. God even had a backup plan to his backup plan. God didn't treat them as they deserve. He doesn't give up on Adam and Eve when they even gave up on themselves. Church, God has not given up on us. He hasn't given up on his church. He hasn't given up on humanity. He hasn't given up on this world because regardless of what we are experiencing in this day and age today, as horrible as this year has been, it does not compare to the first sin, to the fall of humanity, which became a dark comparison. The darkest time from perfection to sin, that was the darkest time. And this that we're experiencing today, God could even redeem the world today. This prophecy of Genesis 3.15 says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between you and the offspring and hers, and he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. This is the messianic prophecy. This is the prophecy that God gave long ago that Jesus is going to come to this world, to this earth, that regardless of your shortcomings, of my shortcomings, of Adam and Eve's shortcomings, it depends on Christ to step in and to restore what was lost because he's the only hope we have. He's the only hope we have. That's why we celebrate this time of Christmas. We celebrate because this is the arrival of that restoration process. This is the arrival that we celebrate that he's going to make all things right. And it has nothing to do with you or with me. He's going to do it. We have to receive it, church. There's three things that this text says and then we'll close. 
The first thing is it says, I will put enmity, this ebah, this hatred. I'm going to put this hostility between you and the snake, between this woman and the snake. And there was hatred. There was bitterness. From here on out, God made that happen. And in this day and age, we might use a different word. We call that a trigger. People are triggered by things. People are triggered by things that they don't like or, or that they may be obsessed with. And, and God created a trigger between us and the devil. He put that there. He put that there from lies. People don't like it when they're lied to. They don't like it when the truth is twisted. They just don't like it. He put this enmity between them. But then he even, and the second thing, he put enmity between he and the offspring, between all of us. When we see something wrong, we have this sense of morality in our minds of what is right and what is wrong. And we try to make things right. And when we see something wrong, we go after it. There is enmity. There is bitterness. There is hatred. Paul even emphasizes, I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. There is an understanding in us that God has placed And no matter how hard we try to fight it until we get to heaven, this is what it's going to be. This is the world we live in. No matter how hard we try to fight it, it's here to stay until God comes back and makes it right. This is the world we live in, church. It's a prophecy. It's promised. This is the world we live in. There's hatred between it. And the beautiful promise in the third part, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. This, in the Hebraic word, is actually talking about a death blow. There will be a death blow between an offspring. And the word used here is of a specific offspring, of a specific person. And refers back to the person who says, I will put enmity, meaning God himself will suffer a death blow. And the devil will suffer a death blow. Jesus himself will come and he will experience the death blow, which he did. But the devil also experienced a death blow. He lost control of this earth and he lost control of you and me. And now we all belong to God if we would choose it. In a sense, we're back to the garden, to a tree, but it's a different tree. It's the cross that Jesus offers life to us and life eternal. And he says, choose today. Every day, church, we must choose. It was a death blow. But God constantly makes the list. He checks it twice and then he remakes the list again to give you a chance to have a gift of eternal life. In the late 1800s, there was Reverend R. R. Harrison. He had company over his house, and he had a famous chess player named Paul Morphy join his company. As the evening went on, Paul Morphy, this famous chess player, noticed the painting on the wall for Moritz Wretch, and the title was Checkmate. It depicted three characters, an angel, the devil, and a young man. And the devil had apparently won the game. And you could see the young man's face of defeat as life as itself was over because he had lost. He thought he would win against the devil this game of chess. But he was outwitted, outsmart, outdone, and he was defeated, staring death in the face. As Paul Morphy studied the painting and realized Something's not right. Something He asked to bring out a chessboard and to mimic the pieces. And in front of the entire party says, is this correct? Is this right? And they said, yes. And he says, I think I can take the young man's game and win. And they set up the pieces. And not only was there one move, as the story old saying goes, the young man has one more move. He actually, in fact, had multiple moves. He had multiple moves out, but the devil had lied to him. In a sense, he had deceived him to think he had no way out. And church, that is no truer than today. We may feel that it is lost, that the chess game is over, but it is not. There is not one more move. There is multiple moves. God has a list, but he recreated the list for you and for me so we can still receive the gift of life. And it is through Jesus, his son. So church, the question is simple today. Will you choose not to chase the things that the devil places before you, 
but will you choose to receive the gift that God has for you today? God wants us to choose life. He wants us to choose Him. Do you choose today the greatest gift of all in the person of Jesus Christ? God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Nathaniel, for that inspiring message. Our closing song will be number 132, O Come All Ye Faithful. Well known and beloved, please sing with us. O come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye to bed. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ. The Lord sing choirs of angels, sing in exaltation. Oh, sing all ye citizens of heaven above. Glory to God. Glory highest. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Yea, Lord, we greet thee. Born this happy morning, Jesus, to Thee be all glory give. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing, O oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Let us pray. God, we find ourselves together again, not physically, but in spirit. During this time where we acknowledge and celebrate when you came to this earth, this dark place, this hopeless and helpless place, you came because of who you are. God, we ask that you would open our eyes that much more to this truth because the devil is constantly bombarding us with distractions, with lies, with things that he wants to satisfy with to take us away from the truth that you are the one who gives us life. God, open our hearts that we might receive the beauty of the cross that you love us so much. God, open our beings that we may be able to follow you wholeheartedly during this season where we say, you came to this dark place. God, I ask for my brothers and sisters, wherever they may find themselves, to trust God, the same God who came to this earth and who died, will come soon. And we can trust, God, that you will fulfill your promise. Guide us, inspire us, draw us closer to you, that people may see you and fall in love with you all over again. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
I was always really interested in startups and I had always really been interested in technology and specifically 3D printing. One night I was watching a video from Stanford and there was Tim Draper who was a billionaire investor and he said I've got a school coming out and you can apply and so it was like right before sundown on a Friday night and so I have like applied super quick and then I got an acceptance right away. And so that kind of started me out on my journey to become a, a startup founder through joining YC, you know, really learned about how fast things can change, how fast things can improve. And these people are investing in you. They're giving you money because they think that you can do great things. You know, really applies to my spiritual walk and how I've thought about that and how I know I can ask a lot more of God because he's expecting a lot of me. I'm a steward because God expects great things. 